Um, as some of you know, Heat and Light is a story set in western Pennsylvania at the advent of uh, fracking. This is uh, a town, Bakerton, Pennsylvania, that uh, has been down on its luck for 25 years. It's a coal mining town. Um, and in 2012, when the story opens, a lot of the people who live in this town um, have a chance to lease their mineral rights to natural gas drillers. So uh, to people in this desperate situation, it seems like manna from heaven. I'm gonna to read to you uh, today from um, a little further into the book. This um, has to do with the camp where the gas workers live. An interesting element of this fracking culture is that most of the work crews come in from out of state. So it's people from Texas or Oklahoma or Louisiana are doing the gas drilling in Pennsylvania. They're not hiring local people. Um, so this tells you a bit about how these imported workers live. The camp sulks at the edge of town, plainly visible from the highway, a cluster of squat barracks fenced off with chain link. The grounds are paved with macadam. Armed security guards man the gates. Inside the fence are two large dormitories. A third building holds a laundromat, cafeteria, and gym. The compound resembles, from a distance, a maximum security community college an enlightened institution for lepers or convicted killers, men guilty of or infected with something lethally bad. Denny Tilsit is the camp manager, a job he'd wish on no one, though he's done it twice before in Wyoming and Dakota. Welcome to nowhere, he tells the new arrivals and rattles off the rules. No drugs or drinking, no firearms, no females on the premises. They think he's kidding about that last one until they get a look around and understand the rule is unnecessary. No female would be caught dead here. Each dormitory sleeps 200. A bedroom is the size of a gas station restroom with a cable TV bolted to the ceiling, a narrow bed, and a desk. Each pair of rooms is joined by a shared bathroom, an arrangement known elsewhere as a Jack and Jill, though in the all-male camp it's more like a Jack and Jack a joke Denny has stopped making. Here you don't even joke about guys jacking each other. The men are sensitive about that sort of thing. A dormitory packed with 200 men, you'd expect it to smell bad. It does, but not the way you think. The corridors reek of pesticide and newness, the manufactured smell of trash bags, cheap lawn furniture, Tupperware, balloons. If anyone asked, Denny would explain that the walls are made of plastic, a special polymer that resists mold and warping. The pesticide odor is self-explanatory, but nobody asks. A name, Daybreak, is emblazoned across the towels and sheets, the comforter and pillowcase. Have no doubt who owns that bath mat. Never forget where and whose you are. Day or night, the corridors are quiet. Always someone is sleeping. The men keep exotic hours. Shifts start at noon, at midnight, at 4 a.m., at dawn. The cafeteria, which never closes, serves bacon and eggs at all hours. It's always breakfast time for someone. Daybreak LLC is a subsidiary of Darko Energy. The company logo, a stylized sunrise, appears on napkins and dinner plates. In the hallway outside the cafeteria are four public computers for the middle-aged and elderly. All the young guys bring their own. The shared computers are used for video chats with wives and children, for checking weather and sports scores, for compulsive bouts of online poker. For porn, though you'd have to finish yourself off in private, they're not ideal for porn. The cafeteria smells of chicken nuggets 24-7. Other foods are served, hamburgers and pizza, but the nugget smell dominates. Exhaust fans blow it into the blacktop courtyard. Intake fans suck it into the bedrooms. The fans run constantly, a loud rush of air like the camp's own weather. It's Sirocco and Mistral. The wind carries the camp's chronic halitosis, plastic and pesticides, chicken nuggets and cigarettes. A girl in California cavorts before a webcam, at least she says it's California, it could be Saskatoon or Gary, Indiana, any place with tanning beds. No Jills in the camp, no Jills whatsoever. A secretary helps Denny in the front office, 
a local woman named Brenda Hoff. She is 50 and squat as a dishwasher. Her eyes bulge froggily. Brenda Hoff is not sexy, has never heard of sexy. Still, the men find excuses to stop by the office, an anthropology lesson, as though Brenda Hoff is quite literally the last woman on earth. It could be Riga or Bangkok or Mexico City, any place with board certified plastic surgeons or their unlicensed equivalent. The game room has a pool table, couches, and another TV in case you get tired of watching your own. Men sit talking and smoking. The new arrivals watch baseball. The veterans have given up on baseball. They are men who'd rather be sleeping, insomniacs winding down from their shifts. The middle-aged and elderly finish themselves off in private. The laundromat smells of chicken nuggets and detergent, the 20-pound boxes of soap power the camp provides. In town, there are whispers, unholy rumors, the security guards speak with southern accents. The supply vans have out-of-state plates. The camp is full of illegal Mexicans, army deserters, Afghan terrorists from Gitmo. Armed marshals escort the prisoners to work. The chain link fence hums with high voltage current. The security guards have orders to shoot on sight. The camp is a hotbed of drugs and prostitution. Local girls are scouted for this purpose, recruited and hired by Brenda Hoff. Girls arrive by the half dozen at all hours, crowded into a Mercedes, a six pack of prostitutes provocatively dressed. Whispers, unholy rumors. The men are white separatists, mercenaries, paramilitary. The camp is protected by its own militia, the fence built to keep the world out. The men's needs are serviced by licensed contractors. Supply vans come and go. The camp's trash is carted away to a secret incinerator. Even its ship is proprietary. The toilets drain into a private septic system somewhere on the ground. I knew it was going to be someone, Price. <laughs> the prostitutes are kept in a bunker beneath the building. This explains why they have never been seen. It is back-breaking work, punishing to the body. There are no soft jobs on the drill rig. A mud motor weighs 600 pounds. The hoisting system uses steel rope. The men yank and drag and push and pull. 12 hours a day, they hump and heave. Some work injured, numbed by painkillers. After 12 hours, they'd rather sleep than drink or eat or talk to their families. With a few youthful exceptions, they would rather sleep than fuck. They are well paid, naturally. A high school dropout can earn six figures if he is strong and willing, if nothing goes very wrong. Now, sleeping is the Bravo crew, the first tower, or most of it. Mickey Phipps, the tool pusher, Vince Legrand, the Derrick man, the roughnecks Brando and Jorge. Their rig manager, who makes more money, has decamped to the day's end. For months, Herc was a vibrant complainer, the thin towels and acrid coffee, the nugget smell. The public is service announcements on every flat surface, framed posters of drill rigs, the company slogan, S-A-F-E, stay accident free every day drilling. It's not even English, he'd grumble. What kind of pigeon language is that? No one else comments on the posters. They grouse about the food their knees and backs. Except for Mickey Phipps, who is Christian, they complain about the dearth of women, even Brando, who is known to have solved that problem. For him, like for all of them, horniness is a conversation starter, a neutral topic like baseball. They spend half their time working, half exactly, seven days a week, 12 hour shifts. When the shift ends, second hour comes to relieve them. The drilling, literally never stops. Who has time for baseball with its long season? For the spectator, it is a demanding sport. They work two weeks straight, then pack their bags. The camp is for on-duty workers only. Other men need those beds. The company runs a free shuttle to the Pittsburgh airport, where Mickey Phipps catches a flight to Houston. The others keep the local bartenders busy and find somewhere to sleep off their liquor in a woman's bed if they're lucky, 
on Herc's floor at the day's end. If they're not, Brando is always lucky. Back at the camp, Denny Tilsit guards the schedule. It's his own private nightmare, summarized on a detailed spreadsheet. Room numbers, arrivals and departures, cleaning crews in and out. When the men return, others will have slept in their beds, watched their televisions, shaved at their sinks. To Herc, the rig manager, it is yet another argument in favor of the day's in. What does he care, says Jorge. They clean the room so good I can't tell the difference. It's 4.30 in the morning, and the men assemble sack lunches in the pantry behind the kitchen. The camp provides bread and cold cuts for this purpose, industrial-sized jars of mustard and mayonnaise. Seriously, man, they change the sheets and shit. What does he care? Jorge is 24 and caffeinated, unbothered by waking in the dark. The others are silent and irritable. Brando lights a cigarette. Vince Legrand swallows Motrin for his back. The morning is dim and moonless. First tower starts at five. A convoy of pickup trucks rolls down number nine road, past a few scattered houses, still dark at this hour. Up and down the Dutch road, dogs begin to bark. The drill site, Federson 2H, glows in the distance, lit up like a stadium at night. Herc's company truck is already there, parked behind the operator's trailer. A magnetic sign, Stream Solutions, stuck to the driver's side door. He sits on the hood, drinking coffee from a day's in cup. Jorge and Legrand park on either side. In the trailer, they gear up, safety goggles, hard hats, and climb the hundred some odd stairs. The rig floor is a platform suspended in midair at the height of a three-story building. As he does each morning, Jorge reads aloud, danger, high voltage, warning, high noise level, hearing protection required. The signs are Herc's pet peeve, one his crew has picked up on. There are signs on the railings and catwalk and V-door, signs in the trailers, the doghouse, the john. Notice authorized personnel only. It's a petty complaint, Herc knows this. He understands that his irritation is out of all proportion, and yet he can't help himself. The signs offend him personally. The bright colors, the capital letters, the repetition in English and Spanish, as in the educational television his kids watched when they were small. By six, the sun is up, the air warming. The Bravo crew is tripping pipe. According to procedure, it takes five men to change a drill bit, five men to pull the drill string from the hole. The actual truth is somewhat different. Three joints of drilling pipe weighs more than a pickup truck, and yet the floor hands, Brando and Jorge, do all the lifting. This is true of racking pipe, true of most things. A drill rig is a hierarchy like the rest of the world. The trip goes smoothly, it would seem to the only observers. The darting barn swallows, the numberless gnats rising in clouds. Seen from above, the men are larger than birds and bugs, but only a bit larger. A drill rig is not scaled for humans. Like a sailor on an aircraft carrier, a roughneck crossing the catwalk looks aphid-sized. Legrand leans out from the monkey board and throws a line around the pipe. The roughnecks are both strong, Brando tall and wiry, Jorge low and heavy. It takes all their combined force to swing the Kelly over the rat hole and unhook the swivel bale from the hook. They attach the elevator to the pipe and step back, panting like boxers at the bell. While they catch their breath, Mickey steps into the booth and grabs the joystick. The hoisting system kicks in, raising the pipe from the hole. One, two, three joints clear the opening. Then another scramble as Brando and Jorge set the slips. With tongs and a spinning wrench, they break off three joints worth. A hundred feet above their heads, Legrand fits the top end into the fingerboard. The trip completed, Herc calls a coffee break. The men are feeling conversational, like women in a beauty parlor they stand around yakking. Brando ignores their chit-chat, tedious shit about Mickey's kids, a caper involving Legrand and a waitress in the next town over. There's always a waitress in the next town over. Figments, possibly, of Legrand's drunken imagination, this army of waitresses no one has ever seen. 
There are 10 times more signs than there used to be, though only Herc has been around long enough to note the difference. This rig, brand new, is particularly rich in reading material. New OSHA regulations, a punishing lawsuit more costly than previous lawsuits. Warning, no entry without supervisor. Danger, pinch point. Herc has yet to see a sign that tells the simple truth. Of all the calamities that can happen on a drill rig, falling is the likeliest. The easiest way to kill yourself is simply missing a step. He's seen up close what a three-story fall can do to a body. He'd do anything to wipe that picture from his mind. Danger, aviso, peligro. It's a truth most people never have to learn, that the human body is simply a bag of blood. Um, well, you know, I, I read this book twice, and hearing you this time it made me think of Orwell's Road to Wigan Pier, mm. um, which is to say there's so much reported detail. There's so much um, you can't possibly know this unless you, you went out into the field. Um, Jimmy Breslin uh, wrote a biography of Damon Runyon. I'm talking about reporters, and this is a novel, but he said Jimmy Bre uh, Damon Runyon did what all good reporters did do. He hung out. So my first question to you is, how much did you hang out? How much did you learn? And Part two of that question is when do you know you've got enough? Because I'm sorry, because I, I don't mean to make it sound like it's journalism, because it was very incantatory, and there was a rhythm and a knowingness and a soul in what you wrote too. So I'm not just saying, well, you know, you went out with a steno pad, but you did your homework. Yeah, a um, lot of homework. That's part of the reason why this book almost killed me. The first two years, it, I, I kept realizing I, I don't know enough about this to write this book. And I, I'm not qualified to write this book until I learn more. And so the process of doing research expanded and expanded and expanded. Um, and my way of doing research always is talking to people. That's, that's what I do best and what I can't get enough of. Um, so I did talk to a lot of guys who work on drill rigs, I did. Um, and, it, you know, at first, um, I sensed that they had a resistance to talking to me. I, the, the perception, I think, was, okay, this is a lady who wants to write a book about gas drilling, so clearly she has an axe to grind, Danger and I don't want to talk to her. Yeah. Um, and um, not everybody would talk to me, true enough. Um, but a surprising number of people did. And I think it comes down to, if you work on a drill rig, nobody ever asks you what your work is like. Nobody. I had one guy tell me, my wife doesn't know any of this stuff. Like, she has no idea what I do all day. Um, because it is, it's very hard work, it is very specialized work, and, and because these guys work together, live together, they're away from their families, they're away from their spouses, it's, they kind of forget how to talk to regular people. That's a direct quote. Somebody told me that, and that actually shows up in, in a bit of dialogue in the book. You forget how to talk to regular people. Um, I, you know, I found them to be surprisingly forthcoming. Um, once they understood that I wasn't asking gotcha questions. The kinds of questions I was asking were, well, at the end of the day, what hurts? Like, where, where, where do you hurt? Um, and nobody can be offended by a question like that. It's, you know, I'm not passing judgment on your life, I just want to understand it. I want to know what it's like to work in this singular environment. How do you do this? How do you keep doing this? And I was particularly fascinated by the guys who are, you know, not 20 years old, who are in their 40s and 50s, because this is just physically punishing work. And it, it was astonishing to me, to meet guys who've been doing this for 20 some years. Um, so I did some hanging out. I did a lot of it on the phone, honestly. Um, it was easier for me to approach people online 
um, because um, there was less resistance to me. Um, you know, it's, it's really simple now to find people who have opinions about things. Uh, I found a lot of these guys by looking at local news stories that are reported online um, and reading the comments section. And often, if the, the story was covering some um, local controversy about fracking, guys who work in the industry would chime in and say, well, I work on a rig, and I'll tell you it's not like that. Um, so they clearly had something to say about this. So I got in touch with a lot of those guys online. Some of them wouldn't talk to me. Most of them did. Um, what, I, what I have found out, and I do with pretty much exactly that, um, and what I found out, surprisingly, is no matter who you want to approach, no matter how intimidating um, what they do is, and no matter how much they might feel uh, paranoia about somebody, a writer coming over, I find very few people in their entire life that ever have someone approach them into, and say what you just said. How do you do what you do? How do you make it from, from dawn to dusk? What is it like to be you? I remember um, uh, a drug dealer I was trying to get close to when I was writing clockers, um, and he had an awful lot to hire. He's a criminal. And um, he said, what's the story? And I just said literally that. He says, you, you want to know what it's like to be me? Well, I've got to tell you, man, somebody should write a book. <laughs> and then I said, well, if you can go back with me about five minutes to what he said, get in the car. And I just ran with him for about a month. It's, it's amazing, like a, journal, a reporter will say, okay, the, the first goal is to get people to start talking. The second goal is to get people to shut up. You know, because once they start talking, it's like, they find that they're hungry. I have more to say, I've been thinking about things. But, okay, at what point in this interviewing people and you know going to the places when do you feel like I got it all right I got it now now I can make shit up you know, it, it's a hard call to make because I love doing the research part I love it I get I get such satisfaction out of it and if I'm not careful I could just do this for years on end and sort of lose okay. track of the fact that I'm not writing anything so it is dangerous it's, it's sort of a trap in that way um, but on this one? On this book, um, it was when people started, I noticed that people were telling me kind of the same things. Um, I was hearing the same things from different guys. I was like, okay, that I'm, I'm starting to notice a pattern here. I kind of get it. Um, and then I would move on to talk to a different set of people. Um, so then, I guess. But you know, invariably, um, you think you're done doing research and you start writing and then um, somebody contacts you out of the blue and said, you know, my buddy told me you're writing about, you're writing this book and I'd love to talk to you. And so inadvertently I found myself doing research even far past the point when I thought I needed to. And I made some good finds that way. So a lot of it is serendipity. You just, you know, you just you is take there, what Is there a general you. point when you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm going to chill on that and start composing my fiction sentences? Yeah, I mean, it's... Because, I mean, the truth is, all the research you do, no matter how exhaustive it is, it only gets you like 10% of the way. Still, the, the lion's share of the project is imagination and empathy. And, you know, there's no substitute for that. You, you can do research ad nauseum, but it's not going to get you past a certain point. I mean, I found, you know, when I was writing, you know, like books that take a number of years, is that I prefer, quote unquote, research to actual writing because writing sucks. It's for me. <laughs> and I would so much rather, and it's just my social life. You know, um, I didn't do anything on the phone. I really had to see people and, and witness things. But it was like being a degenerate gambler. You know, I love this casino of life. And I know if I go home and call it quits, I, if I stay five more minutes, I would have hit the jackpot. And just, again, you, I really needed an intervention. <laughs> and, but I mean, my editor said to me after three years of telling him all, you know, these, these 
small and large things that nobody knew about the drug trade and this and that. He said, well, that's great. That's another fantastic anecdote. But let me ask you a question. What's the first sentence of your book? I said, no, 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 I don't understand the welfare system. I don't understand how the public defender, you know, and it was literally he had to, you know, take me home, sit me, you know, but um, I think a lot of it, I just feel, and I don't know if you feel this way, I have to feel a certain confidence that I know what I'm going about to make up. Anybody who does the job that I'm writing about, if they read this, they're not going to shut the book and discuss and say, that, you know, right. she, didn't, she didn't understand anything. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're my initial audience. Yeah. Did I get it? Did I get it? And like you say, imagination is so much more of it, and people can get seduced and blown away by the knowledge. I mean, the, the, the reportage in there, it's like this happens, then this happens. You don't know any of this, and this is all riveting, but at the end of the day, you can come home with a stack of uh, steno pads like this, your notes. But you gotta take that stack and you gotta boil it down to a couple of hundred pages of fiction. That's, that's the art of novel writing. You know, taking all this learned stuff. Okay, what's, 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 what's the metaphor, the allegory for all this? And that that's, separates the reporters from the novelists. Yeah, I think that's right. You know. Um, most of what you learn is never going to appear on the page, and it shouldn't. The art is in finding, you know, the telling detail, the, the detail that um, that resonates beyond itself. And so it's, you know, you, a lot of it is picking through what you've got and um, letting go of that which is just information. It's the, it's the letting go. Yeah. I can't do this without, you know. You know, going out in the field, going out in the field, going out in the field. Stop. Right. <laughs> I mean, Dr. O once said, note taking isn't writing, outlining isn't writing, <laughs> reporting isn't writing, writing is writing. <laughs> and that's, that's the big thing just for me. And um, so I don't, I don't want to praise this book anymore because. Oh, please don't. Uh -huh. Yeah, I get it once you get a big uh -huh. But I. This, you know, I, um, I think you're one of the most um, uh, seductive storytellers. I would, you know, I would follow you anywhere to see what you would write about that place that you are in. Um, and I'm going to say that, everybody, if you need to hear it again, raise your hand. <laughs> so, but I want to talk about, um, when you're writing a book, it's, it's a commitment of years. Um, I mean... Anybody who can knock out a book is, you know, Boulevard here. Um, it's Sunset Mom, you know, best. Um, how do you know when you found something that makes you feel like, I can commit to this like a marriage? You don't. The answer is you don't. And most of the time you're laboring under crippling doubt, or at least I am. And that is the hardest part of writing a novel is just believing in something that does not yet exist. It's, it is um, such a leap of faith. It's almost like being religious. And I'm no good at that. Yeah. Um, but th this is similar in a way, because you, you are committing to the unseen. Um, and I, you know, as late as three years into the writing of this book, I threw it away and then rescued it from the trash. And you know, it's, um, it's kind of like rock climbing. Like, it's not that hard until you look down. And writing a novel is like that. Once you know, once you think about you know the, the sort of high wire act you're on, then then you realize you're in peril. You know, they say um, there's actually a new uh, entry in a physician's desk reference, uh, or whatever the DSM, whoever has um, labels new diseases, and it, it's something like imposter syndrome, and it afflicts uh, writers and people who have reputations, is that every time you start, all the success and all the confidence that you had before abandons you. You know, um, I feel that, I mean, I just feel like this one, they're gonna, oh, they thought I was good because I wrote that, now they're gonna see my ass. You know, they're gonna see the emperor's new clothes. You know, and it doesn't make a difference. And it got to the point 
where in my last book, I was writing it f for way too long, pulling my hair out, uh, bugling all over the house, I'm in hell, I'm in hell. You know, and my wife was, I witnessed all this stuff. My daughter, um, who's 29, comes over to the house, and my wife describes to her, you know, your father goes through such hell. He said, it's never been like this. And she says, I remember when I was four, he was like this. He was screaming in a room with no one there. <laughs> um, I find it's comforting that, um, you know, fear of failure is a pattern in a writer's life. It's like, hello, old friend. As opposed to, I've never felt like this before. And I felt like that, that to me is a big thing to learn. You've been here before. It's always hell. You're always a fraud, and fraud but actually, you're not. You know, you know, man up or girl up or yeah. woman up or yeah. boy up, <laughs> seven up or something. <laughs> and um, so, ha my last question to you is: I know you said you've already started another book, and that drives me crazy. <laughs> um, what is drawing you to the thing that you're writing now, in the middle of your victory tour? Anguish. Anguish. It's a, it is a, a story that causes me anguish. As, as this one was a story that caused me anguish, as Faith, my last novel, um, which has to do with a Catholic priest in Boston who's accused of molesting a child, um, writing that novel was absolutely driven by anguish. Yeah. I went to 12 years of Catholic school. I had um, wonderful experiences with priests and nuns growing up. I, I truly did. And so when this clergy sex abuse scandal broke in Boston, it was, I mean, it was like, it was physical illness. It was so, it was so um, difficult to square this with my own personal experience, which had been so tender and lovely and um, fortunate in every way. And so it was that disconnect of my inability to make sense of it that made me have to write that book. And um, with Heat and Light, I, I felt something similar, you know. I mean, the, the part of... of outrage? Yeah, there's outrage. There's a lot of outrage in this book. Out, there's a lot of outrage in this book. There certainly is. And, and, and also sort of protectiveness of that part of the world. Um, where I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, this is a part of the world that has had no good news in about 25 years. Um, I was in like junior high when the mine started shutting down and by the time I graduated from high school it was all over. Um, so the town now is just a shell of what it was when I was a kid. Um, and honestly if that place doesn't break your heart you don't have one. It's, it, is, it is like that. It, it's, I have that reaction every time I go back there. It is the purest anguish. And so to think about the people who have stayed, I didn't stay, but all the people who did stay, who've hung on and, and hung in, their, in this community, um, being taken advantage of in the way that they so easily can be by these gas companies, that is an outrage. And it is also a very, very familiar story. You know, if you're from Western Pennsylvania, this is just the latest chapter. Pennsylvania is an energy state. It has always been an energy state. The first oil well in the world was drilled in Pennsylvania. Most people don't know this. So first oil, yeah. And, and then 150 years of coal mining, deep mines, strip mining, then Three Mile Island. It's been sort of one chapter after another in this story of energy. And as um, I got deeper into the fracking story, I realized it was much larger than that. It is a book about energy and sort of our addiction to energy and the, the desperate things it leads us to do and the desperate conditions it leads people in those communities to accept. Um, yeah, it was, I realize I'm, I'm veering a bit off the question, but, um, oh, yeah, who cares? you know, yeah, who cares? <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's a, it, it is a, a part of the world that has shouldered an unfair burden in terms of providing energy to our civilization that has, has such an insatiable need for it. Um, so I, I, I feel protective of the people there. I feel infuriated by, exasperated by the people there um, who are in some ways complicit in all of this. Um, 
you know, it's very instructive to me to look at the difference between Pennsylvania and New York on this question. Look what happened in New York State. There was this concerted political effort to place a moratorium on fracking in the whole state, and it eventually prevailed, and it has prevailed to this day. Um, nothing like this happened in Pennsylvania, nor could it. Why is it so different there? I think it has something to do with the fact that any sort of economic progress <coughs> there has always come with a side order of environmental devastation. People accept it in a certain way. Uh, there's a kind of binary thinking you encounter in people there, that a place can either be prosperous and dirty or poverty stricken and clean. It's A or B. And so there, people have a tendency to accept these environmental conditions that they should not accept and that people in other states wouldn't accept. So it has something to do with the character of that place. And that's what I was trying to get at in this book. It's really a book about the soul of a place. That's a really good answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, like, we were talking, my wife is from northeastern Pennsylvania, anthracite country, and her family is a couple of generations of coal miners. And they're all, you know, Eastern Europeans or um, Italians, the most desperate places in Europe that the miners came from. And the pitch, uh, at the turn of the century, um, the rail companies and the coal companies sent recruiters out to places like Lithuania, Estonia, Hungary, you know. Um, all these places were basically people who were subsistence farmers. And their whole life, their, their life or death depended on crop and weather. They were not making profit, they were just feeding, you know, feeding means potato. Um, and the pitch was, come to Pennsylvania, become a coal miner, you'll never have to worry about weather again. <laughs> um, and, you know, and that's the side of it. So on one hand, these guys were dropping like fly from black lung. On the other hand, they were getting paid relatively handsomely <coughs> compared to laborers and other and they could actually at some point buy a home for themselves in a coal pa in you know one of these patch coal patch towns. Um, but it was this well there's a price for everything. So I never see sunlight, you know, I can only sit sitting up, my lungs are crackling, you know, like somebody's popping, you know, the, that bubble wrap. I will die early, you know. Um, but the other hand, my family has a house. Um, that there, there seems to be a fatalism in, in this trade-off. But now it's all Methlehem. I mean, now all these places are like, <clears throat> there's nothing, you used to be the best little whorehouse in Texas, now it's the best little meth lab in Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's a very familiar story, you know, the, the very limited range of possibilities for people there, it's, it, it's not much of a leap to understand why people are medicating themselves. Um, so the, the main character in my novel is a guy who, he's a prison guard, and his family were a mining family for generations. What happened was his father got laid off and um, opened a bar with his brother. So the father is in the tavern business, the son is a corrections officer in a prison full of drug offenders, and his brother is a recovering heroin addict who is a counselor in a methadone <coughs> clinic. So this used to be a mining family, now it's a family in the addictions business. And that is fairly typical, that is what has happened. I remember there was, um, I'm gonna just make one comment, and unless you wanna say something else, I would like to at least get a couple of questions you know, before we close, because um, youth wants to know. But I do remember reading a story about the Rust Belt and the growth of the meth industry. It said they, they described one sleepy town where every, you know, the people that used to work were all dead. Factories died before the people, or people very soon after. And he said, you see like a 12 year old boy on a bicycle, you know, riding through town, and it feels like something out of um, Norman Rockwell, until you realize the kids got thermos, thermoses, 
you know, attached to his wheels where it's actually cooking meth. You know, so it's Tom Sawyer, you know, with, 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 with uh, traps. And uh, anyways, uh, I think we have a couple, we have about 10 minutes. I didn't want to comment on, on how effective I thought the defining the soul of a place when you were talking about the smells that everything in that camp was that gave off the defining aroma was a petroleum product yeah. and driven by coal power and its manufacturing yeah. and about the third one in whatever that was and mm -hmm. I'm going oh man it's just running the line of like the history of the whole place is just coming back on itself yeah. they go back to what they did in the first place and like all the bad defining characteristics of that, you know, in your case, like, you know, the downtrodden defining characteristics are, are driven from the same industry that, that's now taking you again. You must be a hell of a good breeder. That's a really good <laughs> catch. Thank you. Can I ask you one thing? I've been meaning yeah, to ask you for but very one. quickly because it's Wait, really hard. Show. This is about a reference in the whites that you made uh, to a, a children's television show that I recall from when I was a kid. It might only be you and me in the room are old enough to remember. Just depressing. Even. <laughs> <laughs> Just stop right there. I'm just going to jump out this way. <laughs> <laughs> this. When, uh, when your New York cop is talking to the Westchester cops, and he, uh, I just wondered if this is part of cop vernacular, or you put it in there as a little... Uh, uh, what, what's the show? I can't remember. Uh, the, the Sandy Becker show, whatever. Oh, the uh, <laughs> screaming <laughs> cop named Eva Giba, who was uh, yeah, uh, a big pain in the ass. And uh, it, I figured that... It's very quickly, you know, cops are like hip-hop. Cops picked that People, up, right? <coughs> they have this, like, magnet for all this cultural crap of the yeah, last 50 years. It'll so wind up in hip-hop lyrics. Right. Where cops will make these wild ass cultural uh, Iba Giba type things, and yeah. people go, What? What? <laughs> you know, I mean, then he'll hold on to that. Yeah, so, but, you know, years that's it. There you go. go. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but uh, okay. I mean, I first started watching uh, 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 Kinescopes, you know, the Lumiere oh, yeah. brothers, you know, around. <laughs> oh, not that. <laughs> when the great train robbery, you know, when the train pipes are back here. But anyway, between, between, Sandy, going back. between Sandy and Soupy, we were both. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. To ask you, uh, uh, you talked in the in the uh, reading uh, part um, about the work uh, amount of time work week for the uh, employees, so to speak, um, that they work um, twelve hour shifts for two weeks straight. And what kind of break do they have? And then when do they come back and they do the same thing over again? What, they, what's the actual uh, cycle like? It's fifty fifty. So they work two weeks on, two weeks off. And then come back for two weeks for the same thing. Yeah. Right? yeah. Two yeah, weeks, seven question. days a week, 12 hours a day. Yeah. Right. Um, was there any, uh, in your research, is there any uh, Flint, Michigan type water problems with all this uh, activity going yeah. on with the fracking oh, in the yeah. water in that area there? Oh, yes. It's, oh, a, it's, yes. It's, a, it's a key part of the book. Of yeah. I don't want to give away too much of the story, but um, the short answer to that question is oh, yes. <laughs> um, kind of put context behind my question. I'm from northeastern Montana, where the Bakken region is. So, yeah. I guess I know I'm fairly young, but I can attest that what you described in your reading is pretty accurate. Um, kind of going off of your research when you're asking or getting in contact with people in that industry, did you talk to any people nearby in those towns that were affected? Because I know the town that I'm from. We are a little defensive of how people interpret us, especially since Montana is such a wide state. The other half of the state had an interpretation of us. And so did you communicate or did anyone of that group come forward to you? Um, I did talk to people who live in towns where there's a, a lot of frack activity. And you know, they're, um, they're all across the board in their attitudes about it. I mean, you, you can't generalize easily what people think about this. There are a lot of people who really think this is a great opportunity and um, and can argue very persuasively why they believe that. Um, so, you know, it's not it's not a homogenous group of people. There's these towns are really divided over this. Yeah. Yeah. Just the idea that there's the attitude of um, having a dichotomy between having a beautiful place and being poor or having living in a dirty place and being rich. I mean, don't you find there to be truth in that when, I, like we said, we're from a place where the economy really depends on either 
working with the land or leaving to work it somewhere else. <laughs> right, right. No, there's, there's every good reason to think that way. It is, history bears it out. Um, last summer, I was in West Virginia um, collecting world histories of people who've been directly affected by frac activity. And, I mean, you know, if ever there is a place where this is um, palpably true, it is in West Virginia, Virginia. where mountaintop re removal is still happening. Now fracking is happening. They're putting a huge pipeline through it. And that was a sentiment that was echoed to me over and over and over again. Um, if you bring up the environmental consequences of fracking, the first thing people say to you is, coal wasn't clean either. You know, that, that steel making wasn't clean either. And, so, and you can't argue that, they're right. You also but, say um, you can't eat a landscape. Yeah, yeah, you hear that. <coughs> yeah. So you spent two years researching, and I just wanted to ask about how the narrative voice developed, because it's so um, incantatory is a great word for it. But, but I was wondering, when you were researching, were you starting to hear about it, that? Were, was it developing in your mind, or was that something that after you finished the research, you started writing passages and, and found it? Or I think it was it, it started to emerge fairly early in the process, it's almost as soon as I started writing. Um, I did a lot of talking to people, so the first thing I got was the voices of the characters. And, and um, there's a pretty big cast of characters in Heat and Light, and they're from different regions of the country, so th there are wide variations in their speech, and I, I got so that I could hear these people in my head, and I could, I could hear the, the differences between them. So that came first, but once I actually sat down and started writing pages, there's this other, this other voice kind of emerging, and, and that's what you hear in, in the passage I read to you tonight, that it's really, it's an authorial voice, exactly. and it, it's not something I've done a lot of in the past. It's unique to this book, and it's because this book demanded it in a way. Um, so it, it's it started to started to develop early. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about your process. Uh, while you were writing the book, were you reading other fiction, or did you shun uh, fiction? And who are what writers are influences on your on your work? Oh, that's a great question. Um, when I'm writing a novel, I, I, it seriously curtails my reading of fiction, and that's one of the, the great sacrifices of writing novels, is that I don't feel I can read freely. I read a lot, um, but I read in these kind of narrow categories. I read an awful lot of nonfiction that is you know, thematically related to what I'm writing. It's just research. I don't read that for style. And with every book, there are a few writers that I can read the whole way through, fiction writers. And it changes from book to book. I find that when I start working on a novel, until I find who those two or three writers are, I can't get any traction in the book. But once I have sort of zeroed in on these writers who can help me, who are sort of my, um, you know, my rabbis in this process, then, then I can move forward. And it's, you know, it, it has been different for every book, but, um, you know, for this book, uh, I did go back and, and read a lot of DeLillo again that I hadn't read in some years. Mm -hmm. And I think nobody does an authorial perspective the way he does it. Just nobody. I didn't hear. Ooh. Don DeLillo. Oh. Um, and I hadn't read him in, in a little while. I, I, I love his work. He's always been an important writer for me. But I hadn't read him in some years. And I, and I felt a real hunger to go back and read everything again as I was writing this book. So that, he was terribly important for me in the writing of this book. and I. Never with any of the others, but for this one. Um, so it's always that same process of finding, like, who are my guiding lights in this in this particular project. Who who were the the guides in the other book you mentioned, Faith? In Faith, um, Russell Banks Ugh. and Alice McDermott, um, and those were those were the two that I went back to. And went back to and went back to. Also, thing. Anne Enright, you know, I think it's just, she has just a wonderful style. She writes a sentence like nobody else. Um, and I, I read a lot of her repeatedly when I was writing Faith. So, so those would be the ones for that book. So it's 8 o'clock. Um, one more question and we wrap. Okay. As you say, the book has a big cast of characters, so it must have been tricky in determining how much time you devoted to each of them. I wondered if there were any characters you originally envisioned as perhaps getting more time that you ended up having to cut back their roles? Oh, well, you know, um, 
the, the number of characters increased as I understood more about this, this fracking conundrum. I found myself needing to develop characters who inhabited all parts of this argument, who were on all sides of it. So I, I was really um, interested in doing justice to the whole complex machine of it. And to do that, you know, I couldn't just write about landowners. I couldn't just write about workers. I had to, I had to write about corporate people. I had to write about activists. I had to write about scientists. And so this is the reason the cast of characters got so large so quickly, because there's so many moving parts to this discussion. And I wanted to, to do justice to every point of view within it. So I truly needed to have all these characters. Um, I got very, very attached to, the, to a few of them and wanted to spend more time with them. Um, and and it, it's painful to have to set limits on that. Um, but I, I realized very early on this could be a 2,000 page book if I let it be. Like I, I need to I need to articulate the rules to myself and um, and be sort of stringent about what belongs in the book and what doesn't. What are what are the principles of selection? And for me, the, those principles of selection had to do with articulating all sides of this question. And so characters who were not useful in doing that didn't make the cut. Characters who were not useful in um, helping me kind of plumb the soul of this place did not make the cut. So those were really the two things I was trying to do. One of the things I, that I admired so much is you didn't stay in the trenches. You wanted to go into the general's tent. Mm -hmm. And your portrait of you know, that ex est um, microphone holder who is, is a snake charmer in Houston, you know, was as compelling as the people that you're really hanging around with, you know, chapter after chapter. So I really admire that, that you went, it was like the wire, you know, they went right up to City Hall. Yeah. Oh, I can't do that. Let me just stay with these guys around down here. So but you did must it. do that. You must do that. So, do you want to do you want to take a question? Do you feel like you have your say, or I, I certainly feel that I don't want to be your mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. so thank you.